All righty. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be home. I still consider the Okanagan home. I may have been down at the coast now for nine and a half years, but I still consider this home. So my brain is probably still somewhere over Saskatchewan, just so you're aware. Um, my body's here. I was in Ottawa for meetings at CMA for the last two days, and the time change is a little bit wonky. Anyway, so I was asked to do something a little bit different this time. So we're going to talk about non-face-to-face -face care in BC and how you can bill for it. Um, there, as we move forward in technology, there are a lot of things that are changing in the way that we can provide services to our patient. We no longer have to actually see each and every patient face-to-face -face in our office for that eyeball, eyeball thing to get paid by MSP or by GPSC. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go briefly through some of the general information, MSP fees, um, and some GPSC initiatives, and then we'll open it up to questions. So I, everybody who's ever been to my billing sessions always gets this same disclaimer. Basically, it talks about how I'm doing the best I can based on good evidence, uh, the best, clinical, best evidence uh, for billing issues, and um, that I have no competing interests to declare. A number of resources that are available for you online to, to look for billing information, the SGP website, the BCMA's website always has the MSP fee guide updates as well as the uninsured services updates. Um, MSP has a resource as well. Billing questions, info at sgp.bc.ca or GPSC billing, dot billing I should say, at bcma.bc.ca and you know who the backup is for both of these, moi. Um, the Canadian Medical Association also, I took some of the information here from the CMA from, and from CMPA as well as from the College of Physicians and Surgeons. What's not in here from the College of Physicians and Surgeons, they have a policy document that literally is, was going to their board, I think yesterday, I could be wrong, but I know it's going to their board right now to be finalized around telehealth um, and the positions that they're in. So if you're thinking about going down this road to non-face-to-face -face stuff, I would really encourage you to go to each of these uh, sites to look up the information there. Um, again, this is all just stuff from other, other talks as well. If you don't assume that what you've heard is necessarily correct, we are, as business people, responsible for everything that is billed under our billing number and on our behalf. Um, if you are one who hands it off to your MOA, not just to do a transcription of what billings you want done, but just says, here's my day sheet, here's what I've done, you bill it and they, they bill incorrectly, if it ever goes to the college or to an, uh, to an audit, you're still the one who is going to be held accountable. So you must know what's been done. Uh, the biggest things, I, when I looked through all of the information that's out there, the call, this is the, from the College of Physicians and Surgeons, what's on their website right now. There's, as I said, more coming from this new document. The biggest thing is around the security and patient confidentiality, right? It's the same thing as in a paper record. Now. If you are moving to a telehealth, there is no requirement that you record electronically, you know, the videography of the, uh, of the interaction, but you must still, just as if the patient was in your office, record it into their chart in some form or another. <clears throat> and you do have to make sure that, that the, the privacy of that is guarded the same way as it is. So when we're talking about email, there are some guidelines there, and I'm not going to read through them all. But the biggest one is that number one, that first one. You need express consent from your patients to manage them in this non-face-to-face -face way. The implied consent of the patient-doctor relationship does not apply as strongly to non-face-to-face -face stuff. So the, the CMPA has a template um, that you can look at that talks about, in my office, we, are, we offer email, email services, so it sort of outlines some of the things you put in there. Here's what the pros are, here's what the cons are. Right now, there are not a lot of secure email interfaces. There's one that I heard of actually just yesterday out in Ontario um, that the patients log in on the internet and it sends the secure, so the security is from this website to the doctor's office and back and then when you send a response back to the patient, it sends an email to their regular email and they have to go and log into the secure site in order to read your, your interface. There is not yet a way for most of us to have a true, direct, secure email back and forth with a patient. And that's a challenge because there's, there's an issue about how do things go to the right place? Can they be intercepted? 
So one of the things that has been recommended is that you should always only be responding to a patient, I'll come to your question in a minute, you know, responding to a patient um, email so that you know you're responding to the right way. Is it the patient who actually sent it to you or did somebody else get into their email address and send something? You have no way of knowing that. So just, just as Gurdeep said earlier, to the best of your ability, when the patient agrees through the consent that they are willing to have this kind of, a, of an interaction with you, you have to take it at face value that it was the patient or someone they designated to do so to send that email to you that you're responding to. And that's your medical legal coverage right there. And that's why you need an express consent. Did I address your? Yeah, and, and discovered to my astonishment that even though I've only responded to patients' emails, I looked at the file data and I have 3,000 of them on file. Yes. They, but they're all initiated every single one way. Yes, so the, the comment for the, for the recording was that the, the, you know, responding to the patient is, is the biggest thing. Um, and so we'll go through a little bit more of that. So that way in your consent you can also have a place for them to put the email address that's going to be the one that you're going to get something from. But as I say, there are not a lot of secure email sites yet, uh, ways of processing email yet. So you may want to really think deeply um, about how you're going to offer that service. Can we wait for the questions to the end because otherwise I'm not going to get through this all in the half hour despite speaking fast. Um, so the CMPA, the three major areas of potential liability, confidentiality, confidentiality, privacy, security, we've already touched on a bit, timeliness of response, clarity of communication, that's the other thing. Document the consent, again, we already talked a bit about that. Document the discussion. Now, if you're in an EMR, you may have the capacity either to PDF the email, the two-way email, or a copy and paste from it, but however it works out within your system, you need to document it. In a paper record, you would probably have to print it out and uh, put it into the, into the paper document. Um, the biggest question that CMPA says we all need to ask ourselves, and that's why it's bolded at the bottom, is do you actually have enough information to be confident about the advice you are giving the patient in this non-face-to-face, -face, completely, not even virtual face, um, uh, interaction? So have they given you enough information about the, what they're asking you about? I mean, it's, rel it's a lot easier when it is a follow-up of a condition that they already have. And I think that's part of what the College of Physicians and Surgeons document is going to be talking about is that existing, pre-existing relationship um, and about something that you already have seen the patient in person about. Um, do you have enough information to be confident that, about the advice you're giving? Because that, if it ever went to court, is going to be your biggest thing that you're going to have to uh, um, defend yourself on. Lots of words, again, taken from CMPA and telehealth. Um, I've just literally copied straight off of their off of the website here. And like I said, the big thing is, um, have you complied with all the requirements? Do you meet the credentialing requirements? Do you meet the applicable technological standards? And if the big thing here, now most of us are probably not going to be doing out of province or out of country stuff, but there is a bunch of information on the CMPA website if you are part of a service that may be providing some kind of a, an email or telehealth uh, service that's not just for your own patients. Now I'm going to go into the MSP fees. Now most of these you guys already are probably aware of, the anticoagulation therapy um, fee, not billable on the same day as you have a visit of any sort. <coughs> the 13005 advice about a patient in community care. So those are the, um, when we first brought this fee in, I was president of the SGP and practicing in Kelowna. And I remember having discussions with some of my, uh, at some of the nursing homes I had patients at, and their complaint was the length of time it would take for family doctors to get back to them if they'd faxed them. And getting, phoning through, there was often still that big delay because, you know, it gets in that stack. Um, and once we started paying for the, uh, for responding to that, they said, you know, it's really nice to get these responses within two hours instead of two days. So it incur, you know, when they send you the fax, Mrs. Smith, um, she's got a low-grade fever and her urine smells funny. What should we do? And you write back, dip the urine, start the SEPRA, send it, send it for culture. You send that off and you build a 13005. It's also applicable in other areas where you've had a phone call, say from a, a patient who's at home and under palliative care. And maybe the palliative care nurse um, or the home care nurse wants just a real simple advice from you, a simple, simple comment, an order or something about whatever's going on with the patient at home. 
So if it's a simple piece of advice, uh, basically a simple order that you're giving the home care nurse, then that can be billed as a 13005. People who do obstetrics don't may not realize that this also applies to the public health nurse when they go into the home to see the mom and baby and there's a problem with feeding issues or whatever. If you're giving some advice through the public health nurse to the mom, um, then that also qualifies for the 13005. The 13000 advice, telephone advice to a community health representative in a First Nations community. The big thing here is this is not applicable in communities that have a nurse practitioner. Um, this is ancient wording. And one of the things that I keep reminding both the Society of General Practice, now that I'm not there, and the Ministry of Health is that we need to really sit down and revisit a lot of the rules around some of these fees because they were written back in the late 90s, some of them back in the 80s, and they don't they're not necessarily applicable to the way we practice medicine today. So I think we need a big review of that. And then of course the GPSC has some fees for telephone fees and I'll, telephone advice and I'll go through that in a minute. We do have um, GP telehealth fees. For the longest time we all we had was the 13020 which isn't on this slide right now. And that was for the GP to basically act as the assistant to the specialist who was at, at a distance. So if you had a patient where you had maybe some super subspecialty down in Vancouver and you would go to Vernon Jubilee Hospital in front of the video camera and the specialist would say, could you tell me what you feel when you examine this? So you, you're their hands and you relay what your examination is. You're their assistant there. And that was the only code we had for the longest time. And then Northern Health actually approached the Society of General Practice saying, you know what? We know that GPs actually can provide these services. They're not just assistance to specialists. Um, and can you look at developing a set of fees that would allow um, GPs who are providing outreach to, um, at the time it was for First Nations communities, but to remote communities that didn't have an NP, didn't have a, a physician there, to, uh, so the patient wouldn't have to travel back and forth to the community where the doctors were. And at the time, we only had the secure video linkage was only available within the health authority system. So the doc would have to leave their office, go to the local um, hospital to access the secure video link equipment. The patient would be at the little community nursing station at the other end of the camera and you would have your visit. And so that's where we developed this out of office GP telehealth fee. It's not about where the patient is because none of the patients are in your office. It's about where the GP is. So if the GP had to travel, then they got to bill the out of office one. It was at a bit higher rate than the in office. <clears throat> we also though did develop the in office um, fees because we knew, we recognized that technology was moving in a direction that would allow at some point in time, the physicians to offer these kinds of video linked services from their office. Um, again, there is a security issue and they wouldn't have to travel to the health authority. So this is based on, a, the values of these are based on a weighted average of our, of our various visits. So <laughs> no five age differentials for this. They do like a weighting based on the, uh, the population uh, bell curve and that. And so that's where, we, where the numbers come up with. So those are the codes that you have. You notice the only one that's missing is a complete physical, really hard to do a complete physical at a distance that way. Um, that's what's available through GPSC. And I'll come back to it in a few minutes. In, uh, or through the MSP, I should say. GPSC, we have the telephone, patient telephone management expansions and we have our conferencing fees or the other forms of non-face-to-face -face care or services that we can provide. Um, again, for the GP for me, we've got the participation codes. I put the information about the two of them both up here um, because as a physician with a practice, you need to submit once a year. Um, now that we're going into the second year of, of the attachment initiative, get your MOA to schedule that even though J July or January 1st we're not actually in our office, the date of service should be January 1st because then it's going to keep that attachment door open for the rest of the year. <clears throat> for locums they need to be submitted once a year earlier the better, but then again it's open, it opens the door for them to have access to those fees when they're in your practices um, over the rest of the calendar year. <clears throat> Sometimes some of the uh, divisions, if they have locums who are kind of within a local divisional pool, the division may decide to submit this if the division has the capacity. And now that some, you know, with some of the divisions doing the in-hospital billings themselves, they have a payment number, they have all of the, the ability to do that. So then the division may say, you know what locums, we will submit this for you with a January 1st date of service. So you don't have to worry about it no matter whose office you're locuming in within our community. And once the participation codes have been submitted over the balance of the year, there's the, uh, there's the new GP attachment telephone management fees that are available. 
Right now it is limited to 500 per physician and that includes per locum. They have their own 500 so they don't take away any of the host doctor's telephone calls per calendar year. But they're for any patient in a practice of an attachment participating doctor. So any patient that you're the, MR, the community MRP for or on weekends when you're covering for your colleagues as a part of a call group. Um, the, while the intent is to use, you, is to avert a need for a visit, sometimes it is a matter of, of giving people options and saying, okay, let's do this, this, and this, and see you in two days to make sure it's better, or if it doesn't improve, I need to see you tomorrow or the next year, whatever. So it's not that it absolutely must avert the need for a visit. The intent is to try and do some management over the phone if possible. So a lot of people are using them for follow-up stuff. Patients that they would have otherwise called in to follow up with um, with with uh, results and that, they're managing over the phone and for that they get to bill this. Um, it can be delegated to another college certified healthcare professional. Unfortunately, this is not an MOA. Um, this does include an, an RN or a, a nurse practitioner. Not a lot of family docs have that level of, of allied health at work in their office. The other fee code that we have available though is the original GP patient telephone email follow-up fee. So the 14076 is only about telephone calls. There is none of this email stuff that we were just talking about. That comes under the next fee code, which is the original one that's been here, we've had for a couple of years. The 14079 GP telephone email follow-up management fee. Patients for whom you can use these codes must have had one of the portal fees bill, one of the planning related portal fees. So those are your patients who've had 14033 complex care planning, 14043 mental health planning, 14053 the COPD CDM, while it's not a planning fee, requires a COPD action plan through flu season. If you can manage some of your patients with COPD by telephone, um, you can avoid them getting sicker by not, by not coming in and then delay their in-person visits till after flu season. So that's why, why the COPD CDM is there. 14063, the palliative care planning fee, and 14075, which is the attachment patient uh, complex care planning fee. So once you have billed any one of those uh, fees, you have access to this, this telephone email fee over the following 18 months in actual fact, because they recognize that you may do the planning visit in January of one year, but maybe you end up not needing to do it until October the next year or September because of the, the nature of the patient, um, the way their symptoms are. So that's why we wanted to have an 18 month um, there. You can bill up to five telephone or email, email uh, bill for five telephone or email follow-ups. Um, the email, as I said, requires a two-way communication. So it's not just sending an email blast out to all your patients that says, it's flu shot season, please make an appointment. That doesn't count um, per patient per calendar year. The, this one can be provided, the service, the telephone advice can be provided by your MOA. But remembering it's not the MOA who's originating, who's giving that advice. You're telling the MOA, she's just the re relayer of the information um, because she doesn't have the clinical expertise to actually give a clinical opinion or a clinical advice that way. But you're the one who's saying, okay, phone Mrs. Smith, tell her X, Y, and Z, and if this is what's going on, then we need to make an appointment. If you, know, you, you give her the, uh, the script, to basically uh, work from when it comes to that telephone call. So this one does allow the MOA to be the relayer of the information. The big thing here is because you have these five ones and the new telephone advice fee for under attachment is 500 per calendar year. When you have a patient who is eligible for one of these, don't waste any of your 500 arrows in your quiver, your telephone arrows, because you can use those for other patients. You've got these five that you can use first. So use them up first. Then if you still need more telephone calls with the patient, you can bank on the other ones. Ultimately down the road, I could see this, <clears throat> this fee code being either disappearing or being morphed so it is more of the electronic rather than the telephone one being replaced by that other one. Because once that other one has none of the restrictions, why would we bother having to bill this one at all? But right now, you've only got 500 in that barrel. You've got five per patient in this one. Use this one up first. <coughs> because this one is linked though, to who billed the planning fee. When you're covering for each other on weekends or when you have a locum, in order to bill it and have it not rejected, that little piece on the bottom, um, in the electronic note, and e-notes are your friend, in the electronic note you need to put, you know, so let's say it's me doing a locum because I am doing some locum work. Um, so Dr. Cleland 
um, billing number X, doing locum for doctor, whoever, billing number this. And that way they can look and go, it will get BH'd, unfortunately, because it means a, a person has to look at it. Um, but at least you know that they'll look and they say, oh yeah, this doctor did bill the, the complex care planning fee, so it's appropriate for this person to, to do it. So that's, that's basically the way around so that you don't just get an outright rejection from it. Um, conferencing fees, it's developed to compensate GPs when conferencing with other allied health professionals. You know, so when we first came out with this, again, it started with our care conferences at the long-term care facilities because we'd all get called to do these, usually, right, you know, have to block off part of the time from your office. And unless we actually saw the patient for a visit, which is not what the conferencing is, that's not a visit, um, the only ones around the table, the professionals around the table who weren't getting paid was us. Now we get compensated to go and attend care conferences. So that's where we started with it with the original ones. So all of the conferencing fees, both the attachment conferencing fee and the original conferencing fees are payable in units of $40 per 15 minutes or greater portion thereof. Greater portion thereof of 15 minutes is seven minutes and 31 seconds, technically speaking. Most of these, I dare say, are probably 10 to 20 minutes anyway, so that's one unit. Billable in addition to any visit, provided that does, the visit doesn't occur simultaneously. So think back to that long-term care care conference. The patient happens to be there with their family as well at the table while you're having the care conference. You cannot bill that if that's the only interaction you have with the patient. You cannot bill that patient being there as a patient visit. You need to have that visit separated from the care conference. That gives you an idea of what we mean when we talk about not being billed simultaneously. Billable by, the billable by the community GP who accepts the role of being most responsible for the longitudinal coordinated care of that patient. That is basically GPSC's um, identification of the, the full service family doctor, the community GPs. And we use that, that's what we use through all of our incentives other than the GP with specialty training ones. So the difference now is that we now have the community attachment, the GP attachment conferencing code. This replaces for family doctors who are participating in attachment and personally, if I had a full practice, this to me would be the biggest reason why I would want to participate in attachment because this simplifies it to a single code from three, it replaces the original three, but it also expands the applicability of the code to a lot of scenarios that the narrow definitions of the original three don't apply for. So some of it is, you know, it, it removes the requirement for the on-site attendance for conferencing. So the original 14015 facility patient conferencing fee and 14017 discharge planning conferencing fee required you to be at the facility to participate in that conference. This new one does not require that. It also removes the requirement for two other allied health professionals and says it doesn't matter what the setting is, it only has to be one. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm making rounds on Tuesday morning and um, I, you know, the patient's there and uh, you know, has had a fractured hip, right? And we're, we're a complex patient, has a number of other issues, and we know that if we don't set up some supports in the community, the patient will end up back, well, let's not say comp, uh, fractured hip, let's say they were in with COPD. And we know that if we don't set up some appropriate uh, community supports, the patient's gonna be back in the emergency room very quickly. And uh, you're making rounds and the nurse says, so Dr. Cleland, you know what? We're gonna probably be discharging Mrs. Smith on Thursday or Friday, and we're gonna do a care conference this afternoon at two. Can you be here? And you know what our answer is, yeah, right. <laughs> no, now your answer can be, you know what, I can't be here in person, but I will phone my MOA right now and see if we can't rejig my afternoon so that my 2 to 2.30 appointment is the care conference. You phone up your MOA and you say, can we rejig, just get those two patients. I don't want things squished so we're, you know, we need enough time for everybody, but see if we can't get them to come in a little, at the end of the day. Yes, I will have to stay that at half hour later at the end of the day, but you know what? I can now then phone in at two o'clock, participate in the discharge care conference, knowing that I've been given my input into the ability for us to keep the patient safe in the community and what's going to be needed without having to physically leave the office and go in because that's an hour and a half visit instead of a half hour. So it gives that kind of a flexibility. Um, and th so the other thing it is, this is, again, it, there are two units per calendar day. The original ones were for four, but they're also now two units per calendar day. When we looked at it, the average was only one anyway, so we didn't feel we were really taking away a lot. Um, but it's 18 per calendar year. Remember the original three each have six. This has 18, which is three times six but this is flexible across all sorts of scenarios. 
So let's say you have a patient who's quite frail in a nursing home and actually you end up needing more care conference in time and you need to use 10 units in a calendar year there and two at the hospital. Well before, under the 14015, you would have only had six. You'd have had to provide four units of conferencing with no compensation. But now you can use 10 in the facility. You can use two in the, in the hospital because the total is still 18 regardless of the location where the patient is. So it's not as restricted that way. I've just put the original ones up because the original ones were also uh, restricted to the populations that are there. The uh, attachment one has no patient restrictions. So let's talk about the young patient who's been in a motor vehicle accident and ends up in eMERGE. And the eMERGE doc phones you and goes, you know, we found a bottle of, of pills in this patient's pocket. They're unconscious. What can you tell us about the patient in the community? Um, because, you know, here's what's happened with this motor vehicle accident. And I'm trying to understand, is it something they're on where they, you know, what's going on here? And so then you can go through and you can have that conference with the eMERGE doc now. Tell them about the patient and bill for that. There is nothing under the old codes that that young, healthy, relatively healthy patient, maybe they've got one condition, but they don't fulfill any other requirements there. There was nothing you could have billed before. Now you have the new conferencing codes under attachment that you can bill. For, patients, for physicians who do not want to participate in attachment, they will still have access to the old codes, but they will only have access to the old codes. These are the facilities where the um, old codes are avail available at. When you're in an in-facility care conference, requires at least two other allied health professionals. Again, as I said, the, the um, attachment one only requires one. Uh, I don't need to go into any more details about that because I've sort of talked about it a bit as I've been going through. The, this one still exists, the uh, GP urgent telephone conference with a specialist or GP with specialty training. And you may ask, well, now that we've got the attachment conferencing, where is this actually going to be applicable? So first remember the attachment conferencing is per 15 minutes or greater portion. So you may have talked to a specialist about something and then maybe you had to call home care and maybe you had to call the community pharmacy and through the day you used up 30 minutes and you can build two units. This is for the quick conversation with the specialist. And I'm going to use one that's actually real from me. When I was in my uh, maternity clinic, when I was still doing full service family practice on the side as well as my maternity clinic, I had a patient come in who had pregnancy induced hypertension, had been on medication, relatively stable and all of a sudden her BP's way up. She's completely asymptomatic, no findings. So I phoned the OB on call to say, here's the situation. This is what she's on right now. Is there something I can do in the community to avoid her having to come down or should I just send her down for your assessment? So I talked with the OB on call. Um, it took maybe a three minute conversation. She gave me the advice I needed, set up and I set up the things that needed to be done in ST the next day, yada, yada, right? And it was great, right? Under the conferencing system, I couldn't bill anything because I only spent three minutes on the phone with her. Under this, this was a situation that I needed that advice within that two hours in order to know that I could manage the patient in the community or not. Um, and so I could bill this. So the race line, the rapid access to consultative ex expertise, yes. One of the challenges I've had, and I keep reminding St. Paul's because that's where the program initiated, they're telling all that they're trying to say that OGPs can always build a 14018 and they can't because the GP one requires the urgency. It is based on the patient's acuity that you need that advice within two hours or you're sending them down to the hospital in order to manage the symptoms. So race had it and I'm hoping that they've managed to change that now a little bit incorrect. While their docs always get to bill their fee code because the specialist code doesn't talk about the patient acuity, it only talks about the specialist response time. The GP1 still does talk about the patient acuity. So that's really the only potential discrepancy with what the race may be saying, the race lines may be saying to docs and the reality. And there we are.